I've got a belief that I've got something and I'm prepared to work really, really hard. And I've got the mindset, this money mindset, I'm worth it, I deserve it, and I'm going to do good things with it, then you almost become unstoppable. I, I believe that a lot of your beliefs about money are set before you're even five or six years old. We hear our parents saying, this, I can't find the money. I just don't know where the money is coming from, which is a very strange thing for a child to hear because nobody finds money. Mm. You actually have a gift and you monetize. I remember my little girl many years ago saying, mommy, you don't need to fight with daddy about money because if you go into a bank, they just give it to you because that was her, she saw me go to the bank and some paper and they gave me money. She saw me put a bit of plastic in a wall and the wall gave me money. And I was very aware with her to not give her these beliefs. I was a single parent. In fact, I was in a lot of debt. And she said, mommy, are we rich? I go, darling, we're so wealthy. We are wealthy. We are abundant, we have so much. I never talked about money, but I gave her this belief. And if she asked for something, I could say, well, you know, you, what could you do to earn that? So she wanted this particular toy. And I said, but you have to get a hundred stars. And so I actually have to empty the dish. Of course she cracked dishes, but it was very important. I made her feel she could earn something. And I noticed with her that when she got the hundred stars and we got the toys, never even played with it. She wanted to get another hundred stars because she was learning, oh, I can turn something, I can earn my own money and buy stuff. And, but I see a lot of people who have these very strange beliefs, money slips through my fingers. I don't know where the money's coming from. Mm. I haven't got enough week to last my money. So I'd love to know what your beliefs about money were growing up. What did you absorb and inherit, particularly see and witness as a child about money and income? Yeah, I think I had extremely limiting beliefs about money. My, as I said, my family, I mean, we're we're sort of rednecks out of Arkansas, and 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 then they all moved out to Oregon during the Depression. You know, my mother was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma. I mean, we we're basically right out of the grapes of wrath. <laughs> so it's just this very limiting belief that not even about money, not only about money, but about the people who have it, and they're just different and not necessarily good people because they have money. So that's extraordinarily limiting belief. And it's amazing that I actually became wealthy. I'm the first person in my family that did so. And it was a breakout. And it was a breakout over, I mean, just because of this, this mentor that I got took me under his wing and started crushing these beliefs. I was very, very fortunate. I had, I had a couple of mentors back there in the 1980s that the other one that was so important to me in this regard of beliefs was Dr. Jonas Salk, who developed the Salk polio vaccine and was in uh, near La Jolla, California then in those days at the Salk Institute. And just one, one of these, you know, wonderful serendipitous moments, I met his son at a meditation course I was in. Mm -hmm. And Peter and I got along and he introduced me to his father. And the next thing I know, I'm being mentored to a degree. Um, as I'm putting money into an investment that that Peter and Dr. Salk are in. And so he basically told me, look, you need to change the way you're thinking about things. You have goals and goals are shit, basically. And he said, the reason is, is because goals are just an intention and intentions just, that's the way you pave the, the, the road to hell with intentions. He says, I could have never developed the salt polio vaccine, which is based on science that didn't exist, which developing a killed vaccine into, or a killed virus into a vaccine. Could have never done it if I hadn't made a full commitment, a burn the ships, this is, I will die before I stop here. I learned to transcend, which I think is one of the most critical things I've ever done um, and for a long time, I thought it was something that just, you know, you had to be a meditation person to transcend, or maybe you had to be hypnotized to transcend. And by transcend, I mean, you go beyond thinking process, which I'm, you're an expert in. And, and what I've found was that over these many years is that people transcend all kinds of ways. Kobe Bryant talked about it playing basketball, getting into the zone, and being in that state of, you know, I'm not even doing this, and it's just happening around me. 
And that state of transcendence turns out to be something that uh, very, very good investors either have just naturally figured out or they've learned to do it, to go beyond so that another technique for moving past fear, for staying rational, for sort of staying in the zone um, that I learned from these guys. So those are those are two big things that aren't directly on on the notion of changing my mind about money. But over time, my mind changed about money. I became fine with it. Yeah, you had you got a money mindset. Because I find that a lot of people have this belief that, hey, I've read the secret. I'm just going to manifest. I'm just going to sit at home and, and manifest money. <laughs> and they don't quite understand that that's not enough. Another thing, I'm going to work really hard and make money. I've got a restaurant. I'm working so hard. I worked so hard. But I never made the money. And I always say you have to have three things. The first is you must believe you're worth that money. If you don't believe you're worth it, you'll get it and get rid of it. We know that 70% of lottery winners are bankrupt in three years. I see that a lot of rock stars. Well, I just got it so easily that I don't value it. And I've just seemed to have got rid of it all. So you, you have to believe that you're worth it so that you can keep it. And then the second thing you have to believe is that you, you have a gift that you can monetize and you have to have confidence, but you must have to be able to work hard too. So many people get really confused at the last bit. They think, well, I don't have to work. I mean, because I'm manifesting. But if you if you work hard without the belief, you probably never make it. But if you have the belief and don't work hard, you probably also might never make it. But if you combine those two, belief and talent, you see, belief the talent can get you further. Well, the belief will get you further than the talent if you really have it. We see that all the time with the reality TV stars have got no talent, but enormous self-belief. Other people have great talent, but no self-belief and they don't get very far. But if you have two, I've got a belief that I've got something and I'm prepared to work really, really hard. And I've got the mindset, this money mindset, I'm worth it, I deserve it. And I'm gonna do good things with it. Then you almost become unstoppable. Oh, you, you're bang on. You are so on it. Jim Collins is an author I really like who wrote a book called Good to Great a long, a long time ago. And one of the things he pointed out was that, that companies that move themselves from being mediocre to great went through a similar process of thinking about this. They said, look, first off, we have to figure out what do we have a gift for doing? What is, what is our gift? What, are we, what could we be the best in the world at? So that's their talent, right? Mm -hmm. And then second, you know, um, what uh, are we passionate about doing? What, what do we, can we combine what we're passionate about doing with what we're talented at doing? And, and, will we, and how will the money come from that, right? So those three things they looked at. And Jim said he went back and kind of sh showed this to his wife, all this research and and she said, my God, Jim, I can do this my, in my own life. She was a triathlete. And she said, I'm completely passionate about triathlons. I think I have the talent to be world-class. And if I am, Nike will sponsor me. The money will come. And she went on to win the Ironman wow. on the basis of this thing. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're so on the, uh, right on it, on the money. Exactly. Well, that's probably because I spend a lot of time working with people who have really strange beliefs. You know, I worked with an accountant once who actually couldn't bill her own clients, which was so bizarre. She said, I just, I, I can't bill them. But when I talked to her, she said, you know, my parents are both doctors and they divorced. And it was a very bitter divorce. And my mother had more money than my father, but she always wanted to punish them. So she said to me every Saturday when I said, ask your dad, Tell him you need $100 for a school trip and do not come back without that money. Tell him you need new school shoes and they're $100. And every week, my dad would look at me so sad because he knew it wasn't true, but he also knew what she was like. And he'd give me the money with this sad look. And I remember thinking, I'll never ask anyone. When I grow up, I'm never, ever, ever going to ask for money ever again. And that's not a fleeting thought because it happened every week. It became a fixed belief, a fixed belief. I will never ask people for money. Another client was telling me that she had so many businesses and she just couldn't make money. And she told me that every year they go to India and her mother was saying, give your, this little girl in the street your toys because they've got nothing and give her your favorite shoes. And she said, I had a thought, if I never have anything, no one could take it. Because for a kid, parting with your favorite doll is, is heartbreaking. That's like your little oh, yeah. baby. Yeah. And she believed if I never have anything, 
nobody will ever take it away. And, and that belief, as odd as it sounds, caused her to unconsciously sabotage every business she had. Mm. Another one said, you know, I watched my father come home from work and take antacids and hold his head and go, that's the price you pay for having your own business. Constant mm. migraine, stress, mm. so I, I don't want a business. If that's what it does, I, I want to live without money. And many clients don't even know they have these fixed beliefs, but then they kind of cancel. I want to be rich, but you pay a price that's too high. I want money, but nobody likes you if you have money. I want to be rich, but people think rich people have sold their soul to the devil. And I find you have to go back and kind of extract these beliefs that maybe made sense when you're a kid, like a lot of women say, but if you're rich, guys don't like, I saw some, some reason, he said, I'm so successful, I can't find a guy. They don't like women, I've got my own TV show, and I can't find a guy because they don't like women who have more money than them. And she believes that the field for her to find someone is tiny, but you know, we make our beliefs and then they turn right around and make us. So you, do you find that you can change people's perspective? And then when they change their perspective, that they find opportunities. Is, is that something that you come across? I'm just writing down everything you say. <laughs> oh, that's so These nice. are such Thank great you. notes. Such well, it's so great funny notes. the things that people come up with, because I use hypnosis to just unpick their money beliefs. And sometimes I make them, when I'm teaching a whole class, I say, I want you to shout out your beliefs. And oh, money doesn't grow on trees. Um, I can't find money. And when I make them say, so let's change that now to energy. If I have too much energy, someone else doesn't have enough energy. Nobody likes you if you've got energy. The more, well, you never know who your friends are when you have energy. And when they switch it to energy, they think it's a kind of dumb belief. And then they finally start to give it up. But it's interesting that, you know, our mind is so wired to return to what it knows that. I've worked with so many people who had money, particularly rock stars, and they get rid of all of it so quickly because it's so unfamiliar. And I tell everyone this story. My brother, you know, I came from a near my parents, sent my brother to a paid school because he was the son. And I went to an unpaid school because I was the daughter and they put all their money into his education and nothing into mine. I actually am way wealthier than he is. But he used to do math at school and they'd say things like, you have eight companies and you sell four, how many of you got left? Well, the answer is four, but that message was so subtle. Mm -hmm. You sell four of your, how successful, you've got eight companies and you sell four. So all the time they are wiring these kids in the private school system to believe that they've got all these companies and never say like, well, we're not, the, we don't have money. We, we're not those kind of people. We're ne I, we can't get enough money. It costs too much money. Because my little girl on Christmas was talking about what she wanted. She wanted to send her out a palace and a horse and a swimming pool. Because of course, when they're that little, when you're, when you're in the womb, you have everything. You've got 24 hour room service. It's always 80 degrees. You have a belief you can have everything and, and babies are born like that. And when I said to her, darling, a horse is very excited. She looked at me and she went, mommy, you don't buy the stuff. The elves make it and they give you anything you want because they come onto the planet with such abundance. I can have anything. And if you teach them, well, you can, but you've got to work and do stuff and find out what your gift is and really enjoy it, then... That rid of itself, we suppress these little beings by saying, well, that's too much money. I can't afford that. Who do you think you are? You know, I see parents and they're going, hey, go and pick some candy. The kid comes out of a big box and they go, who do you think you are? I can't afford that. Don't embarrass me. Don't ask. And here's the thing they say, I, I want never gets, which is a terrible way of shutting down that belief of I want does get if I decide how to monetize something. Could you tell our audience why it is so important to clean up your messes and your incompletes? Why do we need to do that? Well, there's two, two levels of that. One is there's incompletes in your environment, all the clutter you have, all the things that are broken and not fixed, all the things that are in the garage and your attic and your basement and your trunk of your car that are just taking up space. Uh, all the things that are 
like a crack in the wall that needs fixed, the pictures that never stay straight, the pictures that are not in an album, we, you know, the clothes that you haven't worn in 20 years and probably never will, they're stuffed in your closets. So all of that stuff takes up psychic energy. Every yeah. time you walk past that crack, you either have to notice it and pay attention to it, or what's even worse, we stop noticing it. So our, our awareness begins to numb out. And we stop noticing the things that are inconvenient, that are uncomfortable. And then we end up in this kind of numbed out state. And um, the other thing is that if you want to move forward in life, you have to have a clean slate, a, a, a clean playing field to play on. I go into most people's offices and look at their desks and look at their floor. And it looks like, you know, a, a, a cyclone hit it. And a lot of people live in places like that. You know, some of these TV shows you see about hoarders where you can't even yeah. walk down the hall. I mean, you can't live an expanded life in, a, in an environment like that. So one is like cleaning up the physical space, but there's also the emotional incompletes, the uh, undelivered resentments and demands and requests, the undelivered gratitude and, and, and thank yous that you have in your life. I mean, right now, you know, when you go into a supermarket, there aren't that many people in there because of social distancing. But we've all had that experience of seeing someone in the supermarket that we have some unfinished business with and we start avoiding the aisles that we think they might be going down so we don't have to confront them and see them. And, you know, we go over to the vegetable side, hoping they'll go over to the bread side and we won't see them before checkout. Um, then you're living in fear, you're living in avoidance. So for me, I believe that everything you clean up gives you more energy it gives you a sense of fulfillment and completion. It builds your self-esteem that you can get things done. I often say to people, if you have beliefs like, I can't even keep my living room clean, what makes you think you could build a successful business? You know, it's like it, it goes together. Um, and so I really think that it's important to clean that up. And emotionally, I want to be in the present moment as much as possible. That's where we live. That's where we create the future from. And that's where happiness and joy exist. Most people are living in the past, regretting things and being angry about things or living in the future, constantly planning or being afraid of what's going to happen. And so the more things I can complete, the more energy I have. Um, there's actually a, a, a study done that a waitress, as long as she hasn't collected the bill yet, can remember everything everyone's had at all of her tables. But as soon as they pay the bill, she instantly forgets and can't remember. And so what happens is you want all those memory units to be available, those attention units to be available to focus on your current tasks and your, your goals, not all of a sudden all the, the incompletes you have running around you. I must admit, I see so many clients hoarding, cluttering, binging, and I found that what lies underneath that is I'm not enough. So people will say, you know, I, I bought those candles to feel good. I'm like, well, that's good. But if you've got 20, why do you need 24? I bought those dishes. I'm collecting this. I've got all these cushions. I, I'm buying more stuff because I'm not enough. And the more I have, the better I feel. But then, of course, if that worked, why would you need more? And so with cluttering, I'm, I find when you keep saying, I, not in, I am enough. If I'm enough, I don't need all this stuff. My husband got very into Maria Kondo's book. And he said, oh, God, I read this great book about getting rid of stuff. And I went, oh, I read it. went, no, I threw it away. I didn't want to hoard it. So when I finished it, I put it, we, in where we live, we put stuff on the wall. And sure. um, when I was moving house, we would just put so much stuff. And people come and take it. And it's such a good feeling because things don't make you feel good. Your interaction with people makes you feel good. And I found during this pandemic giving stuff away going hey i've got all this stuff you know i don't really need it someone else needs it and we're doing a lot of trading in la it's such a lovely thing to connect with yeah, people and it's good. people are cooking people are taking away those little libraries and putting instead toilet rolls and jars of jelly and cans of stuff and it's so nice you know somebody contact me and say hey it's my wedding anniversary and we can't paddleboard. I know you have paddleboards. I'm like, of course, come and take them. And, and they had a great wedding anniversary. But if you if you are hoarding mentally or indeed emotionally, if you're binging, what runs that is not enoughness. And all you have to do is say, I'm enough. I don't need it. Even stops you overeating. I'm enough. I don't need more. As long as you feel not enough, you'll always need more. So the yeah. second I loved, I'm sorry I'm talking very quickly, but I really want to get this in because it's so good, was surrounding yourself with successful people. And it sounds so easy. And of course it is if you have confidence. I'm going to ask you 
why should you do that and how do you do it well why you should do it is because you become like the people you spend time with we actually did a study uh, we become the average of the five people most people hang out with the same level of income uh, if you look at the bars like in Santa Barbara where I live there's the bars on Lower State Street where the really poor people hang out. As you go up the street, the bars become more, more and more and more beautiful and more and more people that are of a higher income. And I remember when I was in Hawaii, I would notice the people wearing the polo shirts would all hang out together. The people wearing the Tommy Bahama shirts would all hang out together. The people wearing the t-shirts that said drinking problem. I don't have a drinking problem. I drink, I fall down, I get up again, no problem. They would hang out together, you know? So basically people were finding their tribe based on their level of I'm enoughness again, based on their level of self-esteem, based on their level of success. And so I always tell people, you want to at least hang out one level above where you're currently being. If you're making 50,000 a year and you'd like to make 100,000, find some way to get into the space of $100,000 a year people. If you want to be a millionaire, how can you hang out with millionaires? Well, you may not be able to hang out with them every day in real person, but they're on YouTube. They've got books they've written. They have seminars they do. You can belong to the country club. You can fly first class every once in a while, you know, upgrade, use your miles, to sit next to someone who maybe is gonna have a better income than you. I remember coming back, I remember using upgrade miles to sit in first class long before I could afford it. And I sat next to the guy who owned the envelope company for sending out the MasterCard bills. And he was the one, I don't know if you've ever gotten a bill in the mail, but there's sometimes there's a little flap and you can pull it out and it's got an advertisement on it. And we started talking about my seminars and my tapes and my, my books and my things like that. And we started talking about putting advertisements for my programs in the bills that went out for master charge. And we actually did a little experiment with that and it was very successful. I never would have met him sitting back in coach. Yeah. So, you know, belong to professional associations, join, become a volunteer. You know, rich people tend to be volunteers. They tend to be on boards of things like the Heart Association. They go to fundraisers. Uh, you know, you could literally serve alcohol at a fundraiser, be the bartender there. People talk to you while they're waiting for a drink. You could, you could establish relationships. So we see this in school too. The A students hang out with the A students, the B students hang out with the B students, the C students, and the kids that are into drugs and alcohol and goth and all of that are hanging out together. And so they're vibing at the same level. So you've got to get up a level. So read the things, meet the people, put yourself in that mind space if you can, so that you start thinking like they think. You start uh, being introduced to their networks, um, the church you belong to, uh, if you go to church, the social clubs you go to. Is the church you go to raise you up and make you feel great or does it make you feel guilty and bring you down? Yeah. So basically it's really important to surround yourself with people who've already done what you wanna do because you'll, it'll rub off on you. Do you know, sometimes the simplest things are really profound. And I love that because some people say, yeah, but if I hang out with millionaires, it just makes me feel poor. If I go out with people with loads of money, I'm really worried about spending that money on food. I, I don't spend $200 on dinner, I spend 20. But the fact that you can hang out online is such a great, so simple, hang out online with millionaires. You know, I, I have the opposite. I often have clients who are gonna go, you know, I can't find a guy. Where are you looking? Well, I go to yoga. Are any men in the yoga? No, it's all women. Well, why are you going to yoga? The men are in the weight room. Go there. Or what? Well, I go to a women's book club. Are there any men there? No. What else do you do? I watch TV. I'm like, okay, you, you have to be proactive. If you want to find a guy, go where guys are. Do wait. Turn up at a car wash on a Saturday. Go to golf. There's not many beautiful women at golf clubs. If you're attractive and interesting, you'll be married in a year. And then I meet guys, I can't find a girl, but what do you do? I'm in the weight room, you need to go to yoga. Um, don't sit at home with your coffee and papers, go to a, cafe, a busy cafe on a Saturday where all the yummy mummies are. Many of those are actually single, but it's so obvious to you and I, put yourself in front of the person you want to be with, whether that's in a relationship, you know, I... I Sure. When I wrote my first book, I, I was invited to a dinner party and ended up sitting next to a publisher who actually ended up publishing my book. But there's no such thing as a stroke of luck or a coincidence. I was committed to writing and the universe put right in my path a publisher. 
So the final thing I love out of your 64 principles was the positive money mindset, because I see so many with the money blocks. I mean, we know because 70% of lottery winners go dead bankrupt in three years because of what you were just saying before. They don't have that mindset. Tom Jones said, you know, when I made it, I had to go to, couldn't go to the pub. If I went to the pub in my village and got out my wallet, they went, there you go, showing off, making us all feel bad. If I didn't get it out, they'd go, what's wrong with you, Tom? You're a millionaire. You can't even buy us a drink anymore. It's like, I couldn't win. Because he left his comfort zone. And many, many lottery winners say, well, I, I didn't know who I was. I moved. People didn't like me. If I stayed in the same place, I went, you shouldn't be in this council house now. You know, you should move. It's not right. And it, it's getting out of your comfort zone. And I always think the lottery winner figures are phenomenal. I mean, I've worked with so many lottery winners who went broke. I've worked with rock stars who are earning $20 million a year for five years. It's, it's not a long career and have no money at the end. So I'd love you to finish with, I mean, I could talk to you forever, but I, I value your time. Why is it so important to develop a positive money mindset and how, how does our audience do that? Well, for, I want to just go back to one second you said about the comfort zones. One of the things I do in my seminars, I have people fold their hands like this, and I have okay. noticed which thumb's on top. Cool. And so then I have them actually take their hands and move all their fingers up a notch so the other thumb's on top. Don't just move yeah. the thumbs, move all the fingers. How does that feel? Everyone says it feels awkward, strange, yucky, wrong, not me, etc. Now, however, the research shows, and if, if we don't have time to do it now, but if I were to ask you to hold your hands like this for five minutes, it would stop feeling uncomfortable. So the way we get out of our comfort zone is two ways. Number one, we do the new thing long enough, it stops feeling uncomfortable. I remember when I started buying, you know, I used to buy my shirts at Nordstrom's for $38, then I became a millionaire and I started buying $138 shirts at the, on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. And I was really uncomfortable going into those stores. I felt like I was out of place. It's like an, the imposter syndrome. They're gonna find out I'm not really this person. But after about, a year of wearing these $138 shirts, I never wanted to go back to a $38 shirt. I developed a new comfort zone. So by yeah. hanging out in the place that's unfamiliar, uncomfortable, long enough, you will get comfortable. It's just a matter of doing that. Everyone who ever learned to drive a car, you went through that awkward stage. If you learned to use a computer, you went through the awkward stage. And now we type with our hands, eyes closed, and we drive a car with one hand, breaking up a fight in the back seat with the kids with the other hand, whatever. So be willing to be uncomfortable because uncomfortable will turn into comfortable. That's the first thing. Secondly, as far as your, um, the positive money mindset goes, Again, it's a mindset. It's a set of thoughts and beliefs. And so those thoughts and beliefs were inculcated either by your parents, by the culture, you know, money's evil, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Money corrupts absolutely. You know, all that kind of stuff that we hear growing up. The truth is, it's not, money doesn't corrupt you. The lust after money corrupts you. People don't even quote the Bible correctly. But the point is that we can learn to be comfortable with money. And what I would encourage you to do is to start examining your thoughts. You do that when you work with people. You've quoted lots of negative thoughts that people bring up. And then look at what is the opposite thought, you know, and then create an affirmation and write it down. And then repeat that affirmation over and over and over and over. Like you can basically do a couple of things. Negative money beliefs can be tapped out using EFT tapping. You just tap on this belief and you can tap that out. Literally, you can disappear a belief in like five to 10 minutes. I've done that hundreds of times with people. You can go back to childhood. Uh, I remember a woman who was basically, you talked about someone like this, you know, we were very poor. Therefore, you know, money doesn't grow on trees and you can't, we can't afford this. Who do you think you are? Don't you care about the rest of the family? You're so greedy, all that kind of stuff that she grew up with. But when she went back and saw that was just her parents living in fear and that she was now 35 years old, the economy was different and all that was available. She had new skills she could use and she was able to say, okay, I can have a new belief now. Now, once you have that new belief, you can also put that in by tapping on while, while you say the new belief. You know, I have enough money to do anything I want. I have enough money to do anything I want, whatever it might be. And you get comfortable with that belief. You can have it on a card in my wallet, which I don't have because I haven't used my wallet in two months because I've only left my house once. I don't have it on my 
personal to him. But where my driver's license shows, I have a affirmation for my goal. So every time I take my wallet out to use a credit card, I see this affirmation for my goal. Um, another thing that my mentor, W. Clement Stone, taught me, he was a good friend of Napoleon Hill, who wrote Think and Grow Rich, is always carry a hundred dollar bill. Now, when I learned that, I was not making that much money. I was probably making eighteen thousand dollars a year as a, a school teacher in Chicago, and to carry a hundred dollar bill around was like, you know, that was a big chunk of money. And he said, every time you pull out your money, you're going to see a hundred dollar bill, and you're going to go, "Wow, I'm rich." So just literally starting to act like that. Another thing that people think they have to do, they think they have to be rich to be generous. You can give away a small percentage of your income, you know, 1%, 2%, whatever. You don't have to be wealthy to tithe. And I'm not saying you have to do 10%. I do, but you don't have to. But the point being, if you tip, maybe give an extra dollar, and it makes you feel a little wealthy that you were able to do that. It was a nice, generous thing you did. And what I find is the more I give away, the more that comes back to me. Uh, I have about 100 trainers I've trained in India to teach my work. And I was just over there in February and they had a little reception for me. And one of the guys who is uh, in charge of all these people over there said to me, he's now requiring everyone there to do two free days of training a month for the homeless, for women's shelters, for sex trafficking uh, shelters, for people in prison, for schools, etc. And he said, every one of the people who's actually doing it, their income's going up. They're actually charting this. The more people give away free time, a couple of times, you don't want to only be codependent, give away all your time. That's also a problem. But if you give away a couple of days a month to charity, to philanthropy, to, you know, a, a nonprofit organization, whatever, what happens is it comes back multiplied. And so the sense that I have, in order to give something, I have to believe I have enough. And so it goes back yeah. to your, I'm not enough idea. There's not enough time, not enough money, whatever. Um, the truth is we all have the same amount of seconds and minutes every day and there's enough money. I love the quote from the Maharesh, the Mahesh, what the hell was he called? Maharishi Yogi. And he was going to buy this school. It was a university that was for sale in Iowa and they've turned it into their training center now. And his student said, but Maharishi, where's the money going to come from? And he said, from wherever it is now. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. You know, yeah. So, My grand used to say, if you wait until you can afford to have a child, you'll never have a child. And we have the same thing. We have 4,000 people I've trained, and a lot of them do two free sessions a month or even a week with people who can't afford it, especially disadvantaged kids. And of course, you're going into abundance, not scarcity. You have to go into an abundance mindset. If I give, right. I get back. The more I give, the more I get back, the more I have to give. So, you know, I can't afford to tip. And holding on to the money too tightly is is living in scarcity and having a wealthy mindset is is a lot to do with having wealth there's so many people i know started from nothing always had wealth i mean i was a single parent in in a lot of debt but my little girl would go mama you'll be rich you go darling we're rich beyond our wildest dreams we are so wealthy we're so abundant i used to take her to feed homeless people because when we came home, we'd walk in the front, and go, oh my God, we've got a fire, we've got heating, we've got a bed, and we felt like billionaires. When you say I wish or why or that's not fair, these are not questions. They're what I call statements of truth. It's never going to happen to me. And you have to totally flip that and go, look at that person. They've just found love and got married, got a promotion, got an amazing career. I'm going to do the same thing, me next, it's my turn. Play that Diana Ross song, it's my turn. And change your language from when, why, it's not fair to I am having the same thing. That is happening to me. Again, these are statements, but these are better statements. I'm having the same thing, that will happen to me. That's going to happen to me next. I'm going to have exactly what they have. Because when you can do that and get into that mindset of me too, me next, that's totally different to, oh, it's so unfair. You see, abundance doesn't just happen. You have to have an abundant mindset. An abundant mindset says it's all coming to me. It's all available to me. I can have whatever I want and I'm going to take the action to have whatever I want. That is an abundant mindset. The opposite of that is, well, that's not fair. I'm never going to get that. Why don't I have what other people have? You must 
must, must, must have an abundant mindset. And an abundant mindset is a choice. It is absolutely a choice that you must make and keep making to become and to stay abundant. The second thing is you must find your comfort zone. Many people have an upper limit. Well, I'd like to earn that much. I'd, I'd like that. I just want to have a little house with a lovely partner and a little baby. But then your potential expands as you move towards it. All of a sudden it's like, well, this little house is too little. This little job doesn't stretch me. And many people get too comfortable. Oh, I like my life. I'm happy here. My job doesn't stretch me, but you know, it's safe and I live in a little safe world. You must make what is uncomfortable comfortable. Thinking outside your comfort zone and you must make what's comfortable uncomfortable. You have to make what is familiar being in your comfort zone unfamiliar and what's unfamiliar, familiar. So let's imagine you've, you've got quite a nice life or you're just where you are and it's so familiar. You have to think, no, I want more. If, if my potential expands all the time as I reach my potential, it moves and moves again, then I better reach more potential because when your mind moves to a new dimension, it never goes back. I was very comfortable being a therapist. I loved being a therapist. It was enough for me. I then wrote some books because I realized I needed more of an income. So I wrote books. I stepped outside that car. But then my husband said, you really have to teach us. My first thought was teach it. I've got to write manuals. I've got to create a course. I've got to find a venue. I've got to advertise it. That was right out of my comfort zone. And in fact, it took him several years to persuade me that your potential will move and move again. And now I love my school. I love teaching. I'm so glad, so grateful. He pushed me out of that comfort zone. But you have to push. You have to do more. I see many people say, hey, I want to write a book like you. I go, okay, do you want to write a book? You better learn to be a speaker. Today, with so many books being published, if you can't stand on stage and talk about your book, and go on shows and talk about your book and go on blogs, it's less likely to sell. So that's an example. I want to do this, but to do this, I've also got to do that. I've got to go in an abundant mindset. I'm going to write a book. That's something. I'm going to speak about that book and get lots and lots of sales and go on tour and talk about my book. That is an abundant mindset. Many people write a book, it never gets published or it gets published. It just never sells. You have to go one more. I'm going to visualize that book in the window of stores. I'm going to see people at an airport reading my book. I'm going to see that book everywhere. So you can have a wish, you can have a dream, but an abundant mindset says, do the work, dream big, visualize big, bigger, bigger, bigger. This is going to be the first book of many. That's an abundant mindset. And again, it's a choice. Having an abundant mindset is a choice. You've got to choose to have it, choose to feel great about it, but choose to do the work that gets you and keeps you an abundant mindset. When I was a single mother, I recognized how important it was to live in abundance. My little girl would say, Mommy, are we rich? I go, darling, we're so rich. We are so rich. We're so wealthy. We're so abundant. Look, we have this lovely home and we have food. And I would always tell her we had so much. And I would actually go to charity shops and buy all her toys there. And she had no idea. I'd go to car boot sales. I actually really loved it. And I'd come home with bags of Barbies and games and toys. And she didn't know. She always had so much when she was very little. I would even wrap up her existing toys and give them back on Christmas Day because she didn't even remember she already had them. So you see how I was living in abundance and I got out of that state of being a single mom with not enough money very fast. I decided to write books, I became super successful, but I couldn't have done that unless I had that abundant mindset to start with. Are we wealthy? So wealthy. Are we rich? We're so rich. Are we abundant? We're so abundant. In fact, I took my daughter to feed some homeless people one Christmas and we came home and I said, look at us, we've got a fire. We got beds with sheets. She went, Mommy, we're so lucky. We've got everything. 
And that's an abundant mindset thinking, wow, I'm complaining about my bills and my apartment, but there's someone on the other side of the world who go, wow, your problem is my fantasy dream come true. So scarcity is a worry. I, I can't tip, I haven't got enough money, I can't afford that. I need to hold my money so tightly, I need to keep it because I'm scared that I haven't got enough and I understand that and I respect that, but you must take yourself out of it saying, I have enough, I have more than enough, everything I need I have, even when it's not true. Because when I told my daughter we were wealthy, was that true or was it not true? It was both. It was not actually really true. I had no money in my bank. In fact, I was overdrawn, but it also was true because I had a wealthy state of mind and I meet so many millionaires. I met Jack Canfield many times, who you know wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. He cut out the New York Times bestseller list, white out number one and wrote in Chicken Soup for the Soul. He looked at that over and over again it became a bestseller. I did the same thing I learned from him. I put all over my house the Sunday Times bestseller. I put my book there and it did go to number one. And when I saw it on Amazon number one, I printed that out and put it all over my house. I also made a vision board all about being abundant. It made me go into an abundant mindset, not a scarcity. I'm worried the money will run out. I don't know where the money's coming from. I daren't let go of this money in case it doesn't come back. I've got to switch off the heating, live on the bread. And I, I have millionaires who still, I'm not putting the heating on, it's too expensive. I'm not paying for that, it's too much because they still live in a scarcity mindset with money. You probably heard of rock stars who are really tight, mean won't spend money. So you can have a scarcity mindset when you're rich and you can have an abundant mindset when you don't have money. But you're more likely to become abundant when you really work at, take the time to have an abundant mindset. Look at your thinking, look at your beliefs and recognize your beliefs are yours to change your thoughts are yours to change. You may have grown up with nothing and with parents who worried, fretted, stressed about money. You have the power to change that anytime. Don't hesitate, do it right now. Check out my next video here. The way you feel about anything at any time is down to two things, the pictures you make in your head, and the words you say to yourself. And number one habit to stop you being successful is waiting for perfection.